I want to start out by pointing out how ironic it is to be presenting the topic of Hebruta or Hebrusa, which is the traditional Ashkenazi way of pronouncing it, which is the way I learned how to pronounce it. Uh, so that's what I'm going to be using uh, throughout this talk. But bo both ways are, are certainly uh, legitimate. In the form of a lecture, me standing in front of you, talking at you, um, and why it's ironic should hopefully become clear in the next few minutes and is really the subject of my remarks tonight. Indeed, the spirit and practice of Hebrusa contradicts many of the dominant modes of both creativity and learning in the modern period, first in Europe, then in the United States, and of course beyond. Beginning with the Renaissance and continuing through the Enlightenment and Romanticism, despite their profound differences and, and in some ways even antagonism, the image of the individual creator emerged as the ideal. We need only think of iconic figures like Leonardo and Michelangelo, Immanuel Kant and Byron, Einstein and Gertrude Stein, to appreciate the degree to which creativity and individuality, what we might also call genius in its most extreme expression, have taken pride of place in the modern Western tradition. Indeed, have even helped to define what it actually means to be Western through much of the modern period. And there's a, a, a very strong connection between uh, individuality and individuation and, uh, and modernity. At the same time, many of the ways that we interact with and learn from the products of this creativity have also stressed individuation. Think, for example, of that most classic expression of modern literary creativity, the novel, a genre which is produced by individual authors, the novelist, and consumed by individual readers, preferably sitting alone somewhere without the distraction of other people. Against this backdrop, however briefly sketched, the phenomenon of Hebrusa and its difference may be appreciated. The word itself is Aramaic, which along with Hebrew is one of the two languages of creativity and learning, and I really want to link those two things because I think they really are embodied uh, in, in Hebrusa, that have been shared by Jewish communities around the world for the last 2,000 years and more. Like other words in Semitic languages, including Hebrew, Aramaic, and Arabic, it is based on a root. In this case, one that means to join, to fasten, or establish friendship or association. Etymologically, then, Hebrusa is related to the Hebrew word chaver, or friend, made famous to English speakers by President Bill Clinton in his farewell to the assassinated Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin in his phrase Shalom Chaver. Hebrusa means fellowship or friendship. But over the centuries, in traditional Jewish culture, it has come to mean friendship of a very particular kind. An ongoing partnership of creativity and learning typically focused on the study of classical Jewish texts, often by students in a yeshiva, although traditionally um, people would also engage in it after they were no longer in a yeshiva. Though to this day, if you go to one of the larger or smaller yeshivas, famous places like Mir or Lakewood, there will be a day when people will get together in a big room like this and choose their chavrusa, choose the partner that they're going to learn with, and it looks it's something like a cattle call, uh, matching survey. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite an interesting thing to observe or participate in. The spirit of Hebrusa finds expression in collaboration, in dialogue, and relationality. In Hebrusa, the outcome of creatively learning together is not known in advance, predictable or linear. Instead, outcomes, if we want to hold on to that word, appear as flashes of insight, which over time may or may not come together to form patterns or larger conclusions. A chavrusa may begin with a text at hand, or just as often with another subject that is seemingly far afield, and it really can be anything, and people who have participated in it may know that it, you could start out by talking about the World Series or something that happened to you, and yet somehow often ends up connecting to the text. In a creative process, that sometimes seems like magic when it's really working, the partners in a chavrusa come to understand the text that they are learning, and the word studying is traditionally not used, it's learning, in profound ways, and just as importantly, they build a relationship that is both like and unlike other kinds of friendships or partnerships they might have. And I might point out that chavrusas are typically not exclusive 
relationships. You can have multiple uh, chevrusas. In fact, I drove up here from Santa Cruz with one of my chevrusas sitting in the audience. Um, now, it is hard to overestimate the degree to which the spirit of chevrusa, if not the actual practice that I have just described, has animated Judaism from the very beginning. Indeed, we might say that the first articulation of this spirit occurs in Genesis 18, when God debates with himself whether he should share with Abraham what he is planning to do to the towns of Sodom and Gomorrah, and it's not a good thing. Um, well, I suppose that's open to debate. Um, ultimately, he decides to do so, and what follows is one of the most extraordinary scenes in the entire Tanakh or Bible, and I want to read some of that so you get a sense of, of, of why I think it, there's, there's a connection to Hebrusa. So this is uh, Genesis 18. Now the Lord had said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, since Abraham is to become a great and populous nation, and all the nations of the earth are to bless themselves by him? For I have singled him out that he may instruct his children and his posterity to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is just and right, in order that the Lord may bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, the outrage of Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin is so grave. I will go down and see wh whether they have acted altogether according to the outcry that has reached me, and if not, I will take note. Abraham came forward and said, will you sweep away the innocent along with the guilty? What if there should be 50 innocent within the city? Will you then wipe out the place and not forgive it for the sake of the innocent 50 who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing to bring death upon the innocent as well as the guilty, so that innocent and guilty fare alike. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? And the Lord answered, If I find within the city of Sodom fifty innocent ones, I will forgive the whole place for their sake. Abraham spoke up, saying, Here I venture to speak to my Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. What if the fifty innocent should, should lack five? Will you destroy the whole city for want of the five? And he answered, I will not destroy if I find 45 there. But he spoke to him again. And he said, what if 40 should be around, found there? And he answered, I will not do it for the sake of 40. And he said, let not my Lord be angry if I go on. What if 30 should be found there? And he answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, I venture again to speak to my Lord. What if 20 should be found there? And he answered, I will not destroy for the sake of the 20. And he said, let not my Lord be angry if I speak but this last time. What if 10 should be found there? And he answered, I will not destroy for the sake of the 10. Now, one of the things that's beautiful and so striking about this is, of course, the interaction between uh, God and Abraham here, and that it starts with a question. If I want Abraham to be the person by whom the rest of the nations will bless themselves by, should I keep this knowledge from him? And how does he get the knowledge? Through this exchange, through this interaction, through this learning, this give and take, this, this chevrusa. But even more than that, the ultimate conclusion is that it's 10. It's not one. It doesn't come down to an individual. It comes down to 10 people for the sake of 10. They should be saved. The idea that creativity and learning is grounded in pairs rather than the individual is a foundational principle of rabbinic Judaism from its very beginnings during the time of the Beit HaMikdash, Beit HaMikdash, or Temple in Jerusalem. Thus, Jewish tradition holds that the first phase of rabbinic Judaism was characterized by five pairs of sages, or zugot in Hebrew, culminating with the most famous pair of all, Hillel and Shammai. And it should be pointed out that more of, most often, Hillel and Shammai did not agree in fact, it was their disagreement that was uh, seen as giving a creative spark. And as the rabbis would say, both, both of what they said was, were words of Torah. Significantly, unlike a novel written by one individual to be read by another, the three Jewish texts traditionally accepted as canonical, that is the Tanakh, the, Tal the Talmud, and the Zohar, the, the chief text of Jewish mysticism or the Kabbalah, are all the product of collaboration and were also traditionally learned by two or more individuals together. Very rare for someone to sit down and read the, any of these things from, from cover to cover by themselves. And very difficult to do that as well. Even the Shulchan Aruch, the set table, 
the most important Jewish legal code that was initially authored by a single sage, in this case, Yosef Karo, only became accepted by Jews in communities throughout the world when another sage, Moshe Isserlis, or the Ramah, added his own glosses known as the Mapa, the tablecloth. Indeed, we might say that it is the spirit of Hebrusa that animates the great modern Jewish philosopher Martin Buber's concept of the Ayin Thou, despite its seeming distance from the halls of the yeshiva. And that's where I'd like to end my remarks. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of the evening. <laughs>